So my name is uh, Dr. Juan Francisco Vada Juarez. I'm working here in Lausanne in the lab of Professor Dal Perraro and Dr. Chang Kao in Switzerland. And today I will talk about uh, the use of mass spectrometry to study membrane protein lipid interaction in SMA nanodisc. This work was done uh, when I was at the University of Oxford in the, under the supervision of Professor Anthony Watts. So first of all, I will do a quick introduction on membrane proteins. So membrane proteins, they represent approximately around 30% of the human genome and they are key part of the cellular signal. They're effectively, as I was saying before, the gates and exits of the cell. They can also see like windows, they have different type of proteins like transporters, ion channels and receptors that can fill and let molecules go in or out. As a consequence, more than 50% of the current commercially available drugs target membrane proteins, and therefore we need a deep understanding of the structure and mechanism function. Lipids are very important molecules in the lipid bilayer and also for membrane protein because they modulate their function. And here we have a allosteric role of membrane protein that's been demonstrated even more recently in the mechanosensitive channel of small conductance, where some lipids, this kind of lipid is the 18-1, can reduce the size of the MSCS, whereas other lipid, PC10, can enlarge the pore of the MSCS. Lipids may also be subjected to radiation damage when you have a membrane protein uh, crystal structure and a completely incompletely model here. As you can see, for example, this example, if it, even if it's very old, the KCSA, so it's a potassium channel, they have model uh, diacylglycerol and also a fatty acid, where it should be a PG lipid. So therefore, how can we just extract membrane proteins? Usually, people were using detergents. And even though they have contributed significantly to experimental advances in understanding membrane protein function, they remove and perturbed bound lipids that are next to the membrane protein of interest. And therefore they have a direct influence on protein activity. They also modulate their protein activity. So the problem is like detergent-based membrane protein purification, as I just said, disrupt, as you can see here on the bottom left, they disrupt the lipid bilayer, and then they can effectively break lipid protein interaction and they can give rise to protein instability, so aggregation or non-native conformation such as misfolding or other kind of non-native conformation are arising. And this has the consequences of, you know, spending a lot of time and money to find the correct detergent to extract the correct protein in a correct fold uh, state, impacting then on the protein function. So people, what have been doing here is using different, you know, membrane mimetics, as you can see, picodis, nanodis, liposome, or bicell. But the problem is that the first step of this reconstitution all rely on uh, detergent-based methods. And as I just said here, I just have a quick video just to show you how OG detergent molecule just intercalates in between um, alpha helices of a GPCR and start to, you know, unfold it. So the big question that we have here is like, why should we use detergent? Because as I just said, you have the stability into the detergent is not optimal and you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money just to find the correct detergent. Also, once you are in the detergent, you lose the lateral pressure that you have while you have in a bilayer. But then if you reconstitute inside, like let's say in a liposome, then you didn't have the real kind of environment that you got in the cell membrane. So you have an artificial lipid environment. And therefore, necessary lipids that could be important for protein function or activity could uh, be lost. And therefore, your, what you're observing here is not the real picture of how the protein function. But is there any way to avoid detergent? And I think we all know the answer is yes, right? We're in the small journal club. So we can use SMA nanodisc, or we call them lipodisc because we were using the polymer from Malvern Cosmeceutics as an alternative to detergent. How it works is like this polymer called styrene malic acid, right? So the styrene here and the malic acid here, where you have different lengths and different ratio in between these two, can just intercalate in between the bilayer and then at some point extract patches of lipid where you have then maybe inside your protein of interest. Um, Lipodisc compared to other kind of 
um, protein mimetics, they are most stable over a range of temperature and pH. And as I said, the pH here and the temperature could also arise, you can, by tuning the styrene malic acid, uh, whatever you want here. Interestingly, since 2018, since this first kind of uh, cryo-EM protein determination here structure, where this cytochrome AA3 has been solved, there is more and more now uh, protein uh, in smalls being used, small being used for protein determination. What I found very interesting in this paper was the fact that they can, they were able to see the lipid anchor going inside the bilayer, and also they were able to see really the lipid protein interaction, even in between protein protein uh, interface, where they were really seeing this. But this is great for, you know, huge or massive large complexes where you can use cryo -EM. And I just told you that for X-ray crystallography, sometimes the protein, well, all the lipids are damaged and we cannot really see that. So is there any way where we can, you know, determine this kind of protein lipid interaction? And to do so, we use uh, bacteriodopsin as a model system. And why we use it? It's because it's a very abundant protein in the purple membrane of Halobacterium cyanarum and archaea that you can find in these purple salt lakes here in Australia, not also in California or in Spain, for example, very hot kind of uh, salt ponds. It's a seven transmembrane heli helical structure, looks like a GPCR, even though it's not a GPCR. And its function is a light driven proton pump. It's also involved in the energy generation for the archaea. The trimeric protein forms an hexagonal lattice in the purple membrane. So if you have a look on the bottom left, you can see that you have patches of bacteriodopsin. This is an EM picture here. The B is an EM picture where you can see how the uh, protein is, forms an hexagonal lattice in the purple membrane. If you look on the C, you have an AFM, so atomic force microscopy, where you can definitely see that the protein forms a kind of hexagonal lattice where you have the trimer in there. Interestingly, you only got 24 lipids surrounding the protein and six are positioned within the trimer, as you can see depicted in the trimer lattice here. The purple color that we observe is due to the retinal chromophore, which is covalently bound to the bacteriodopsin on the bottom right here, the yellow kind of uh, molecule that you can see. And it's easily purified via sucrose gradient. And from one liter of expression, you usually got five milligrams of protein. So quite a good system to work with. So we use our detergent-free approach using SMA here. We wanted to use the monomeric, so the smallest protein uh, as possible. We did not want to use the trimer just to really to monomerize it to see if we were able to see protein lipid interaction only with the monomer. And to do so, we mix the purple membrane with DMPC because the, as you just uh, seen, there is not that much lipid to form uh, lipodisc here or you know, uh, nanodisc. So we use it in a ratio, that lipid-protein ratio is depicted here, 200 to 1, in order to have one monomer of bacteriodopsin per lipodisc. And we use no detergent during this reconstitution, so we just mix them together. We use the SMA 3 to 1 in this case. We form the lipodisc, and then we purify just by removing the excess of SMA. And we hopefully should have a monomeric BR incorporated into lipodisc. And the advantage here is that we have the stable environment, conferred by the SMA, as well as the native lipid composition should be conserved, and this I will show you in a minute, as well as the structure, native structure is conserved, as well as the other non-covenant ligand also. And it could be useful for functional and structural studies since you can access both sides of the protein. So here is just a slide to show you that effectively BR is purified and folded in lipodisc, as I've shown you here, SDS page, you can see from the purple membrane, we have the monomeric, dimeric, and trimeric protein, as well as the um, lipodisc. We only got one band around 27 kilodaltons, referring that we should have only the monomer. In the middle one, we have the CD spectrum, where we can see the purple membrane is in pink, and the lipodisc one is in red. You, we just observe a shift towards left on side, and this is due probably to the lipid scattering now that we have a bit more lipid than in purple membrane, but the shape looks the same. And on the right, you have a dynamic like scattering where you observe that the purple membrane size is approximately 100 nanometer diameter 
where we use the SMA, we have something less than 10. So effectively, we are forming lipodisc. But this data doesn't tell us about if we have lipid in contact with the protein or if we can identify any ligands, neither if the oligomeric state is really the monomeric protein. So here we use the nanoelectrospionization mass spectrometry in order to solve this question. And I think you got Mike Marty a few weeks ago talking about that. So I'm not gonna go dive in into fully detail here. We'll just quickly show you how we use it. So nano ESI MS compared to ESI MS requires microliter of sample, very small droplets. Therefore, you don't need that much energy and less harsh condition to dissolvate and dissociate your macromolecular complexes. It's ideally suited for mass spectrometry of membrane protein and also for soluble protein and their complexes in buffer solution in which non-covalent interaction are maintained. So I took this picture here on the left hand side where you can see it's reproduced from all mass. It's the spin-off of the group of Carol Robinson, the collaboration we had in Oxford that was doing this uh, native mass spectrometry. And what you can see here is like first you have charged droplets from the nanospray when they are dissolvate. So you remove basically the water. And this is a membrane protein now in my cell. So you can see the micelle here. And then you have a protein protein interaction. You start to activate with some gas. And then you at some point eject the protein from the micelle, hopefully without any detergent bound to it. And what it looks like on a mass spectrum is the one on the right hand side. So you can see at the bottom one, you have no energy. So you basically see nothing because you have so many overlaps between the peaks that you can't see anything. But as more as you add energy to it, then you start to see very well resolved peak for your protein here. So basically, that's what we did with the small cell lipodisc in these uh, nano letters that we published earlier this year. We first took the lipodisc, ionized them in the NSI, we activated them, and here we hopefully should disrupt the bulk lipid here, which should be the DMPC we added, and keep some non annular lipid bound to the protein. And the SMA belt should go off. And then we isolate this protein complex, do tandem mass spectrometry, hopefully to dissociate this lipid protein complex to identify what is the lipid here, and then analyze and have the composition of our complex. And the data looks like that. So on the first, on the left hand side, you have the BR in detergent. Here we use octyl glucoside OG. And the reason why we use OG is because it's one of the stable detergent for BR. It has been used many times and it's the kind of standard, let's say, for bacteriodopsin. So you can see that at 25 volts, collisional energy, we don't see anything except a hump. But at 75 volts, we can we start to see a nice peak of protein. If we do the same for behind the MPC lipodisc, you can see that again, from zero to 75, suddenly we start to have very nice peaks corresponding to the mass of the protein. Interestingly here, I should say that we have similar voltage to see the protein. So it means that the kind of gold standard for OG detergent is the same as the DMPC uh, lipodisc. So why using detergent if we can do the same in DMPC lipodisc? And due to this low voltage, we, are, we enable then tandem mass spectrometry to be performed in order to know uh, lipid protein interaction. We also did a comparison between the DMPC MSP nanodisc, so the a membrane scaffold protein nanodisc compared to our DMPC SMA nanodisc. And you can see that we need less energy here to have the same kind of quality of spectrum. And we think this uh, data here, why we need a high, or, well, let's say low energy for lipodisc is due to the MSP having more kind of intramolecular bonds, like uh, hydrogen bonding in between the lipid and MSP, which is another protein. So you need to dissociate the protein from the lipid to have then your protein from another, you know, protein uh, injected. So again, we also need lower voltage than MSP, which is a good point uh, also for us, because we, again, uh, can be do uh, perform like a tandem mass spectrometry. If we dive in and zoom in and have a look, what are the different peaks that we observe here? We can observe that we got several pulsational modification from the mass e extracted. So all of them, you can see that we have six different 
uh, masses corresponding to six different sequences, all of them having different truncation. Uh, but all of them have the retinal sheath base and the major protein, the first one on the top, has a PCA and PCA stands for pyroglutamate. It's the kind of final modification where you can see the glutamine cyclicize into a pyroglutamate and this is to avoid the protein to be degraded. We can see that we got several truncation and we were wondering why we got so many truncation because when we suddenly analyze the one from BR in LipoDisc, we, instead of having six different ones, we only got three. And one of them hopefully was the major protein. And we were wondering why we got so many truncation in the detergent one compared to the LipoDisc one. So we went back to the literature and check about Edman degradation, denatory mass spectrometry. And it was interesting to see that some of them were also present uh, in the Edman degradation, but the detergent seems to kind of extract more protein than was uh, before. But with our technique going via the DMPC, MSP or SMA nanodisc, we'll only be able to have these three species here. And we were wondering if this could be related to the folding into the lipid bilayer. It would be like a signal being like, we have a short end terminus and then we have the deletion of the last amino acid. And this means that the protein could be incorporated into the lipid bilayer. So we did a control experiment, just trying to incorporate it misfolded BR into SMA nanodisc. And we know from the literature that when there is no retinal bound to BR, BR is partially folded and it's not able to go inside uh, lipid uh, particles. So we performed the chemical bleaching to remove retinal from fully mature protein in detergent, then try to reconstitute in uh, liposome via, uh, sorry, in lipodes via liposomes and did the native mass spectrometry and denatory mass spec. And very interestingly, we were not able to detect any signal from the bleaching BR in lipodisc, meaning that effectively it seems to have a kind of discrimination between what is partially folded and fully folded in kind of lipid. So we end up with this kind of scheme here, you can see on the right hand side where we got some immature and mature protein isoforms in the purple membrane. And if we go via detergent, we basically take them all from the purple membrane, which could be interesting, of course, to know how the protein matur maturation pathway is occurring. But then imagine that you want to crystallize the mature form only, then you can do this kind of selection via going via the DMPC and the SMA and just have the kind of isomer, isoform that are fully folded in uh, lipid bilayers. So with this kind of data, we think here we are discriminating against incompletely folded BR. But as I told you, this is the kind of protein part where we have seen that we can incorporate selectively folded protein. But there is also the study of the protein lipid interaction I was bothering you at the beginning. Um, so can we see this? And for MSP nanodisc, interestingly, we need very high energy to release the membrane protein from the MSP nanodisc. And usually a few oligomer and protein lipid complexes are typically observed in the spectrum. So you can see here, we need 100 on the bottom left. You can see that we need 150 and 200 volts to be able to see this kind of lipid protein interaction. For SMOPs, there is already a kind of study that showed that using little bit, so this laser induced liquid with ion desorption coupled to a time of flight mass spectrometer, we can have the determination of the oligomeric state. But due to the resolution, limitation of the resolution of the TOF detector, we were not able to see protein lipid interaction. So here we came back to our spectrum and have a look if some of these peaks that are present could be related to protein lipid interaction. And effectively, as you can see here in panel A, we got BR plus one DMPC plus two DMPC plus three and plus four. So meaning that the protein is really having a protein lipid interaction with the bulk lipids that we put. But also we got this 2DP, the green one, 
And this 2DP is a very interesting uh, lipid molecule, which is found in archaea and seems to be in close contact with the rhodopsin studied here, so bacteriodopsin. And also here, we use the tandem MS just to be sure that what we observe as a kind of protein-lipid interaction is effectively so by just increasing the power, and then we can see release of the lipid and the protein. We use the BR in OG just to test what was the difference. And we can see that very, I think this is quite uh, interesting also to see that BR is also in interaction with these 2DP lipids. And we're wondering also if this could be the reason why OG is so a good detergent for bacterial obsidian. Maybe because it's keeping some lipids next to the protein to keep it like folded. We then use another archaeodopsin 3, which is a homologue of bacteriodopsin, which we saw the structure also recently in Nature Communication. And we were also seeing that they got like several lipid adults. DMPC, the 2DP again, but another lipid, which is very unique to the organism which is expressing AR3, uh, SDGD lipid, which is thought to also regulate the osmotic flux in this archaea where IR3 is expressed. Again, we use the tandem mass spectrometry really to assess if this was covalent or non-covalent interaction. And then we use again the AR3 in OG to check what was the spectrum looks like. And you can see that we have lost the AR3, uh, sorry, the 2DP kind of interaction with AR3, and we only got our AR3 SDGD kind of interaction. So maybe here the 2DP now in kind of interaction is lost because the OG is displacing this kind of uh, lipid compared to what we have before. So I think here I want to make a point that we show I show you that native mass spectrometry of lipids can provide information on the proteomic, uh, sorry, on the protein oligomeric state, sequence, post-transitional modification, folding, lipid composition, and the protein lipid interaction directly from native, native environment. But can we use the SMA to study lipid composition of a living organism? So something that lives, you know, something like C. elegans. And C. elegans have been studied for many years. I think probably 40, 50 years. And it is one of the first organisms who has its genome uh, completely decoded. And its exoskeleton, called the cuticle, forms a barrier between the external environment is poorly characterized. And this is quite uh, interesting too, in terms of either in terms of lipid composition and protein composition. And the cuticle provides the body shape of this C. elegans, motility, and also the protection. It can change towards when you have a pathogen, for example, infection. And also, it can also change for having the worm, like to say, floating in water or going deep into the water. So the buoyancy of the worm could also be affected by just changing the lipid composition. So we have this, uh, so the collaborator here in Oxford, Dr. Delia O'Rourke and Professor Jonathan Ochkin working on this C. elegans got a very interesting kind of mutant strain, uh, which was resistant to some pathogen. So you can see here that leucobacter called Verdi-1 infection leads to what they call the warm star. So the tail of the wild type uh, C. elegans starts to be crowded by this uh, leucobacter, and then they just like glue together, and then the C. elegans just die. But they, by genetic uh, generation of several kind of strain, they find out that AGMO1, which is a mutant lacking a protein involved in lipid biosynthesis of the alkylglycerol monooxygenase, so it's just an uh, ether link lipid, suppress this Verdi-1 activity or sensitivity. You can see on the bottom right that there is no infection on the tail of the C. elegans of this mutant strain. And how is that possible? It's probably because the cuticle is different. But how is it different in terms of alkyl glycerol composition? So lipid composition is different. Or is it also due to the protein lipid change? So what we propose to do, and what we did effectively was to take this C. elegans, add uh, SMA3 to 1, and check if first they were still alive after the treatment of SMA, and then if we were able to extract proteins and lipids. So 
I think this was the first experiment we did. Uh, you can see on the left, you have before the SMA, you have a C. elegans floating around, let's say, swimming. And then after the SMA, it was still the same, very happy with it. Uh, we got the viability, we check, it was more than 95% of the worms survive after the SMA. And we use it for uh, up to 40 minutes, uh, 40 minutes and uh, 37 degrees at 10%. Uh, weight volume. So it was good that the first uh, survive, and then we were interesting to see what was happening in terms of this formation. So we use again DLS, dynamic like scattering, and we were able to see that in the N2, so in the wild type, we're not able to form uh, that much disk. It looks like the two nanometer radius uh, that you can see here is just free SMA. So it's not really extracting anything on the C elegance wild type one. But for the Agmo one, you can see that there is a very uh, significantly change in size. We go from something from three to six nanometer, and there is no this, uh, this kind of small peak in the DLS. We analyze, uh, we put it into a SDS page to see what was the difference. And we were very surprised to see that some proteins in N2 was, were there, but not that much. Compared to Agmo one, what looks like to be different and a lot of more proteins. We effectively checked how many proteins were present. So we got like 89 protein in common between the N2 and the Agmo one. Two were very unique to N2, but 60 proteins were very unique to Agmo one. And this is just a major alteration in the surface of the cuticle. And finally, what we did was just to meld it off uh, use Malditov here in, from the SMA that we extracted. And we found out there were some lipids that were shared between these two, between the N2 and the Agmo one that are represented in green. And also you can see that we have some ceramides uh, in yellow, which are affecting the buoyancy of the worm uh, here. So this is very important lipid also for the cuticle. And in red, at the bottom, you can see that we are able to identify ether link lipid from the Agmo one. So this is was, I think, the gold standard here. It was really exciting to have that. But I think from this, you can also see the difference is like from the Agmo one mutant, we got many, many, many different lipids compared to the N2. And we think it's the Agmo one strain here attempts to compensate for the increase in ether link lipids by modulating other lipids synthesis pathway. So as a kind of summary slide here, um, I just wanted to show you that SMA nanodisc effectively can be used for native mass spectrometry experiments. We have, uh, we have used low voltage required to do tandem MS can be performed. We have similar or slightly better MS spectra for MSP nanodisc, which is good. It means that we can use at least the SMA nanodisc for uh, mass spectrometry. It looks like we can discriminate folded from incompletely folded uh, species here, and the native lipid protein interaction can be characterized as well as the oligomeric and some contrastural modification. And then from the SMA, as I just shown you before, we can use it on a living organism without affecting the viability. And we have been able to determine the lipid composition as well as the differences in protein abundance. And I think this is what we said in the NanoLetters paper. We say that we foresee that combining SMA nanodisc and native and denaturing mass spectrometry, let's say mass spectrometry, will play a key role here in the study of membrane protein lipid interaction, ligand binding. Uh, you can think of now GPCR, so having like some pharmacological interest. Folding of protein is also important. How the protein folds into the lipid bilayer is something very interesting also to, to study. And the elucidation of the native lipid composition, especially you know, in kind of uh, pharmacological also uh, thinking. And as a, sl a last slide, I would like to acknowledge a few people uh, from the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Oxford. First of all, Professor Anthony Watts and Dr. Peter Judge, who were really uh, teaching me everything and supervising me every day doing this project. A few people like Dr. Javier Vinas and Gary Taylor for the microbial rhodopsin expression, the group of Professor Jonathan Hodgkin for the C. elegans, Malvern Cosmeceutics for providing the SMA, and the group of 
Carol Robinson in Oxford for the native mass spectrometry. My university college, well, my college, university college for funding and the BBSRC. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you very much, Ian. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have. I have a few, but I allow you to unmute yourself and ask your questions. So, Yon, uh, what library do you use to assign your uh, lipid uh, fragments? So you mean the, the one, which one? The one from the... Uh, from the, yeah. the mass, so we use the yeah. lipid maps database available online to uh, identify the, the mass okay. to, to do so. So yes, because otherwise it's a huge, uh, it's a huge work. It effectively, uh, it doesn't look like that. It's quite a huge work to do, to do so. And can you assign almost uh, every uh, lipids that you, you see on your mass spectrum? So from the from the Maldi, I would say it's quite uh, it's quite tricky uh, because uh, you have uh, some uh, you know contaminants and you have also the matrix and can make some interaction. You can have different ions, so it, it, it was more tricky from the Maldi kind of side. I think from the native mass spectrometry, I think it's maybe more easier because you can combine both. Can combine the native and then the denaturing, and then you can play a little bit more. But from the Maldi only, it's quite difficult. I think one uh, experiment I would uh, I would do with this kind of uh, Maldi here, it would use different matrix for the Maldi, right, and then combine them all, and then see if we have some redundant uh, peak to really assess what was there. Frank, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi Juan. Um, I also wanted to ask you a question about Maldi. It was a very nice talk, by the way, um, very interesting. Um, Maldi is, is, of course, not really as native or even not native at all in comparison. And yeah. I guess um, you wanted to look more at the components there and not at the whole release of the intact protein. But could you talk a little bit more about how you see the role of Maldi for analyzing lipids and or protein from smalt? So I think uh, the Maldi here, we, we, we use it. So the, the, the proteomics I show, it was done by a different technique, not Maldi. It was uh, really uh, not a technique that we, we didn't use uh, Maldi here. But for the lipids, it's true that, as I just said to, to Manso, I think we, we, you need to really have different kind of matrices to really play a little bit more. Uh, here, we were just really interested to see if already the, the, the lipid composition was different. I think it was quite surprising that it was that different, right? Uh, you can see the number of lipids that was, uh, and I cut it a little bit here because I didn't have that, that much space in the slide. But um, again, for the, for the membrane, I think then for membrane proteins, I don't know how we didn't even, to be honest, we didn't try to, to extract membrane protein and put it on a Maldi uh, plate. Mm. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe there is something also to to play with, but uh, we use more the the trypsin uh, trypsinized FASP methods here to analyze the right the, because there's always an ionization bias as well, and also for the lipids in particular, right? So maybe yeah. it's quite complementary between electrospray and Maldi if you're yes. only looking at the lipids for a moment. Yeah. So here we're also quite surprising that uh, some lipids that were not really uh, shouldn't really ionize well, right? We were yeah. also able to detect them. So it means that they are really abundant, right? And in terms yeah. of if you really put them a lot. Uh, and also the, the, the charge we use here, the let's say the charge of the lipid we, we were observing was consistent with what we should observe. So it's the cuticle should be negatively charged. And most of the lipid we we're using also were kind of negatively charged lipids. So it's also uh, quite uh, interesting. And you looked at both polarities. I so guess. that that's the other thing we didn't look at. We look only at a positive one. Negative, I think we tried sometimes, but it was quite difficult also to have kind of um, lipid standard that would also fly or something like So it was a bit more tricky. So that's why we fixed only on this kind of feature here and didn't go for, I would say, what we saw already was already enough for, for us. So. Um, but I think there is, as I said, there is a whole world in behind here that we can really play yeah, with. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. 
to welcome. Any other questions? I have one more, uh, particularly related to the negative mode and positive mode. Do you think positively charged polymers are good for negative mode of mass? So that's something we tried also uh, going into negative mode uh, into the um, native mass spec. But it didn't look to be that promising, to be honest. It was more interesting to go positive mode. But as now we have more and more polymer, I would say, maybe it would be interesting to have a kind of screening of polymer. Because here, we're, the, all my thesis, I would say, I was stuck with the three to one. Um, most of the stuff we did, uh, drug delivery and everything we did uh, related to mass spectrometry was using the SMA three to one. So maybe now that we have this SMA QA or this SMA EI or something like that, maybe it would be interesting to see if they behave differently in the, in the mass spec. From my point. Yes. Sorry, could I just come in on that maybe? Um, so hi, I'm Peter. I work with Juan hi, Peter. for four years or so. Yeah, so, so what we thought was actually happening in the mass um, spec instrument was that the SMA was picking up protons um, and that was causing the, the lipidus complex to fall apart. So that was partly why we needed a lower um, voltage to, um, to get it to fly essentially. So you need, you need to have some sort of ionization reaction taking place. Um, and, and you'll all know that when you change the pH of SMA, then you protonate and you deprotonate those carboxylic acid groups, and that induces a, a conformational change, which might involve then the polymer dissociating from the disc. So that's what we thought was taking place. Um, I think in the terms of the, the positively charged polymers that we've got at the moment, you haven't got that because you've got quaternary ammonium ions. You haven't got that possibility for a, for a proton to come on and off. So it's, it's definitely worth trying, but um, yeah, I, I, I think you're gonna need some free carboxylic acid groups in order to get this to work properly. Excellent, thank you very much. That was very helpful. Any other questions? What do you, do you suggest if, for example, we have a protein and uh, we cannot release it uh, in mass spectrometry experiments? For example, we have SMA and membrane protein in, for example, the MPC disk, but we cannot release the protein at all. I had this issue and we couldn't figure out why is it happening. So go ahead. Did you, because I think there is one um, interesting experiment that uh, Mike Marty show also on the small uh, journal club, right? You, he's adding some kind of small molecules that disrupt, right? This kind of lipid protein interaction and release the protein. So I would, I would suggest maybe to have a look at what kind of molecule he was looking at. Um, okay. To, to have a look, because I think we also had this kind of problem with some uh, other membrane protein we tried. It was also very kind of um, sticky with lipids. We didn't have a clear, very nice spectrum, I would say. But uh, I think this kind of um, very small molecule that uh, Mike Marty and the field of, uh, let's say, native mass spectrometry now is using um, could be maybe of interest for you. I think I have a feeling that... Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that was interesting. When we were uh, unfolding the protein by heating it for like 10 minutes, the protein was there, but we couldn't release it. That was like, makes sense. Maybe some uh, destabilizing region like the one that Dr. Marty was using would be helpful. Yeah, probably. Any other questions? So, do you think. Uh, yeah. Can... yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, I have. Uh little query about uh, your uh, work. So if you are really interested about the lipids only, you don't need the, if you don't need the membrane protein and lipid interactions, if you just know and to know the lipids 
was a present along with the uh, small disk. I I think is it is it um, I uh, is it possible to just uh, dissolve the lipids in some organic solvents and then try to uh, uh, like uh, identify them? What are those? Yeah. It sounds so, so you can do that, but um, I think you will end up doing the same as doing a detergent extraction. Um, we did that for the Maldi one because we wanted to see the lipid composition effectively. But you need to distinguish between bulk lipid annular lipid mm. and non annular lipid. And I think for right, this, right. you need definitely either the structure, as I've shown here, or you need the native mass spec to tell you at least it's fairly interacting, right? Uh, yeah. So definitely, yes, I think you need uh, this kind of uh, mass spectrometry here. Yeah, it is possible to keep a standard without expressing that protein, maybe, or some, some, some disk which is not having the lipid having the protein in there. Does it make you, sense? Too? You mean, I mean having the protein express where the lipid yeah. is not? Uh, yeah, yeah so you, can always, is, you, you can always do a reconstitution, system. right? Uh, you can right. always do a kind of reconstitution where you avoid, if you know already that a certain lipid is interacting with your membrane protein and you want to really, you know, say that your protein is not active or something like that, you can always try to reconstitute it in a lipid composition which is avoiding this lipid and then try to see if the protein is active or not right that's i think what you are telling me no or try yeah. to crystallize it or cryo em to see if there is any kind of difference but uh, for small protein i think the big issue here is the uh, resolution that you would get uh, either you go x-ray crystallography and you have a not very well model lipid or you go to cryo em but you don't have neither kind of high resolution enough to see that so yeah right okay thanks yeah so just to add to that it's often the case that the lipids that bind that are essential for protein function are pretty low abundance in the membrane so if you just do a kind of a bulk lipid extraction um, it's often very difficult to see in a multi-type experiment the, the crucial lipid that actually needs to be bound to, to some sort of binding cleft on the protein. I see, I see. All right, Definitely. thank you. Definitely, yes. One more questions we can take, or if you are... Uh, just it could be very like very lame question, but can we determine this uh, like the binding constants of, for example, a protein a lipid using native mass spectrometry? Something that uh, like uh, classic mass spectrometry uh, used to do that. So you you mean like determining the KD of the lipid? Yeah, yeah. I think it has been, I'm not sure it has been done, but I know that um, from detergent samples, membrane protein, you can titrate some lipids to see the interaction to them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the KD. I mean, you can possibly say if you have one more, the stoichiometry, yes, but I'm not sure if this relates really to what is happening in uh, real life, I would say, because you're still in the gas phase. So I don't know, maybe you can do it, I would say. It's probably that you can do it, but it's not the same gas phase versus where we are. So uh, real life, let's say, but uh, yeah. And the last question that I always struggle, if you want to know what part of your protein is interacting with the lipids, what would you do? Uh -huh. using mass spectrology. We had this issue and we couldn't, we, the protein was too small, too little. So yeah, if you have any insight on that. Feel. Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, and you didn't have the kind of structure or anything of the protein, right? You just We did, a... yeah. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, we had a structure, every, everything was uh, like uh, well uh, established for that protein. It was such a small, like 20 kilowatts and a beta barrel. But uh, we were interested in uh, identification of what part of the protein is taking the lipid substrate or interacting with the lipid substrate. But 
is there any way to do this with uh, like mass spectrometry? I don't know if there is maybe some, uh, I would say, well, I don't know. It's quite tricky huh? because uh, depend, if you don't know exactly where it is, I think it could be quite tricky. Uh, thinking of doing something with uh, NMR or something like that, but this is probably way too complicated, I would say. Um, otherwise than mass spectrometry, uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, so the, the localization is not uh, well, uh, I mean, lipid localization is not that much easy with uh, mass spectrometry or native mass because, spectrometry. Uh, yes, I mean, you can also use maybe something like EPR to know, try to localize where you, you spin label one and you spin label the other and you try to locate within, you know, distances, let's say, something like that with pulse EPR. Maybe you can do something like that to then try to figure out where is your a specific or specific kind of lipid interaction with uh, your protein. Uh, that would be one of the kind of um, experiment I would do. Uh, maybe Peter, you have an idea better than me than this on this, but uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think this is quite a tough one to do. I mean, I, I think if your protein is large enough that it's got different domains, and you're either able to cleave some of those domains off or to separate them, um, then you can try that. Um, but the problem is that most transmembrane domains and most transmembrane proteins, you know, are sort of, they live or kind of die together. You know, you, you, it has to be either fully there or fully not there. Um, so all you're going to really ever be able to tell by mass spec is whether it binds to the transmembrane domain or not. Um, I think the, the, the key insight you get from mass spec is the identity of the lipid. So you might not know, say, from uh, an X-ray crystal structure, um, what exact lipid you see electron density for in your structure. And that might, as Juan said at the beginning, that might be because you've got some radiation damage because your electron density is not fully resolved. So the, the key power of mass spec is actually to tell you what that lipid should be. And then you can go back to the crystal structure and you can model that particular lipid in. So the 2DP lipid, for instance, that Juan told about, the 2DP, uh, the 2DP is actually the protein data bank code. And we were able, obviously, to look back into the protein data bank and we could see that particular lipid at various um, crystal structures of bacteria rhodopsin. Um, I think the other thing, obviously, is a computational approach. So again, once mass spec has identified the lipid, then you can do some sort of docking experiment, um, which is looking for a, for a favorable binding site. But again, just as Juan said, you've got to bear in mind that you've got the rest of the bulk lipid, the annular lipid around as well. Uh, and again, as Juan said, you know, you've got the, um, the, the, the uh, thermodynamics inside a vacuum in the mass spectrometer is very, very different to the thermodynamics in a, in a cell where you've got a membrane and you've got the water phases either side. So I think the answer to your question is very difficult to do and you've got to use kind of two or three techniques at least together to get the answer that you want. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you so much, everyone.